A CDC epidemiologist holds the burden of solving the mysterious deaths of all the passengers of a plane from Berlin. He doesn't know that the disease is unlike anything he's ever seen before, and its spread could mean the end of the human race. On February 8th at 8pm, Regis Air Flight 753 from Berlin is about to land at JFK Airport in New York. Rose, a flight attendant, answers a call on the intercom from her co-worker, Peter, who is at the back of the plane. Peter needs Rose's help with something urgent. On her way, Rose stops by Gabriel Olivar, a rock star, to tell him to turn his devices off. Next, she wakes up a sleeping Joan to put her seat back in the upright position. Then, she speaks to a young French girl, Emma, wearing a red dress. At the back of the plane, Peter is spooked and says there's something alive in the cargo hold. Rose doesn't want to alarm the passengers, so when she sees Ansel looking back at them, she closes the curtains. Peter says that it was big and he heard it moving underneath the floor. Rose knows that no animals were listed in the manifest, but Peter says the thing tried to open the latch but moved away when it heard Peter. Rose then gets on her knees, opens the hatch, and looks down at the cargo hold before closing it back up, assuring Peter there was nothing moving inside. Suddenly, something bangs on the hatch door, trying to break through. Rose tells Peter to inform the pilot, the landing crew, and emergency services. The metal door distorts from the force of something pushing on it from below until it bursts open. A large, cloaked figure floats from the hatch and attacks the flight attendants. At JFK, Robbie, an air traffic controller, informs his superior, Bishop, about the Regis air flight that landed on the service apron. The flight crew isn't responding to their transmissions, and the plane's radios and lights are off. Shortly after, Bishop and Robbie head to where the plane is, and Robbie says that the crew and passengers amount to 210 total people on board. On the tarmac, Bishop walks over to the plane and notes how cold it is relative to how recently it's landed. Robbie notices all the closed window shades except for one. The police arrive, and Bishop tells Robbie to get all emergency vehicles from different government agencies to the taxiway. He makes sure no one in the control tower shares any news of the dead airplane. At 8.35pm in Astoria, Queens, Dr. Ephraim F. Goodweather, an epidemiologist for the Center for Disease Control CDC, parks illegally outside a family counseling center. He asks the man parked behind him to tell the meter maid to say he's in there for official CDC business, so he won't get a traffic violation ticket. Inside, F sees his son, Zach, who tells him he's 10 minutes late and helps him with his tie. In the counseling session, Kelly, F's wife, with whom he's been separated for a year, waits with the counselor, who reminds him that he's been late for four of the six court-appointed custody counseling sessions. He says his job keeps him busy, and Kelly agrees and thinks it's why he's never present in their home life and why she wishes to go through with the divorce. Abruptly, F's phone rings, but he chooses to ignore it. F doesn't want out of the marriage and suggests quitting his job if it means he'll have more time for Zach but Kelly doesn't want him to stop because she knows how much he loves it. She's also thought of moving in with her boyfriend, Matt, who F realizes is the man he talked to outside. F's second phone rings, which means he is urgently needed and Kelly tells him to go. Afterward, he answers Dr. Nora Martinez's call, and he tells her to stall the other agencies until he gets there. Outside, Matt sarcastically tells the doctor that he couldn't stop his car from getting ticketed. At 9.15pm at the taxiway, Jim and Nora inform F that Homeland Security is getting ready to enter the plane. None of the 210 people on board called 911 during the one hour the aircraft's been grounded. A Homeland Security official plays a recording that their Dessler mics detected, a rustling sound from inside the plane. F convinces the official that the CDC should enter the plane first in case of a contagion. Meanwhile, at 9.28pm in Harlem, Crispin Elizalde and a friend enter a shop owned by Abraham Setrakian, a pawnbroker. Crispin tries to sell the older man a stolen silver-plated watch. Once Cetrakian is distracted, he grabs the money behind the counter, but the older man catches him and grabs his arm. Cetrakian threatens to cut Crispin's arm if he doesn't let go of the money or if his friend doesn't surrender the gun. The young men do as Cetrakian says, and they leave the store. On TV, Cetrakian sees a news report about the dead airplane from Berlin and looks worried. He opens a secret door and goes inside. In the basement, Cetrakian dismantles the gun and unsheathes a sharp blade with an intricate handle. He sits on a chair, talks to a heart in a jar, and says he's back. He can't fail this time, but is afraid he might not have the strength to fight anymore. Suddenly, the heart starts moving, and Satrakian asks if it's hungry. He nicks the tip of his finger and drops his blood into the jar. Then tendrils come out of the heart and feed on the blood. At 9.45pm, F and Nora put on oxygen tanks and hazmat suits in the CDC tent. He mentions how Kelly has seemingly moved on with another man, and she says he did the same with her. F says Kelly doesn't know he and Nora were together because he never told her. Later, Jim sets up monitors outside the plane as F and Nora enter the aircraft. Inside, all the passengers are in their seats and have all perished. 
They note no signs of struggle, chemical agents, bruising, or markings on any of the bodies. Nora says their machines detect high, but not deadly, levels of ammonia. Jim informs them that there's no ammonia in the manifest. Minutes later, F sees Emma and examines her. He says there are no signs of trauma or bloating. The girl's tongue and palate are pale, her eyes are clear, and her skin is dry and inelastic. Nora suggests they use their UV lights, and suddenly, the entire cabin lights up, revealing splatter patterns of a biological-looking substance. She thinks it may be where the ammonia comes from and wants to take samples. Then, Nora heads to the front of the plane while F takes the back end. F passes Ansel and the man's sand twitches. F opens the hatch to the cargo hold and tells Jim to have it emptied and checked for biological agents and ammonia. He then drops light sticks down the hatch and lowers the camera, and the compartment is covered in the same mysterious substance. In the front of the plane, Nora notices the open cockpit door. Jim warns her not to enter because it's supposed to remain locked, but she goes in anyway. Nora touches the pilot's face when the man suddenly gasps her air, startling her. Behind her, Bolivar stumbles into the cockpit dazedly. As F rushes to help Nora, Ansel stands up from his seat and asks the doctor for help. F tells Jim to send in paramedics for the survivors. At 10 p.m. in the Stoneheart Group building, Thomas Eichhorst rides the elevator to the penthouse. The man blinks using a set of vertical eyelids before he steps off the elevator. In the room, Eichhorst speaks with Reggie Fitzwilliam, Mr. Palmer's caretaker. When Palmer awakens, Eichhorst informs him that the cargo has arrived safely and all four survivors have been found. At 10.05, F greets the CDC director, Dr. Everett, who they take to the cargo area where the dead passengers are kept. Nora tells the director that the survivors will be isolated in a local hospital. Everett tasks F to speak to the families of the deceased, and says it is imperative that they not cause panic to the public. Nora makes Everett promise there will be no press when F speaks to the bereaved. In the CDC tent, Joan is asked for information she might have about what happened on the plane. In another tent, F speaks with the pilot, Captain Redfern, who says he remembers landing the plane but nothing else after. Moments later, Ansel says he hears a noise in his head and wants the doctors to look at his ears again. F advises the man to stay inside his tent for the time being. F then sees Bolivar and asks him about his rockstar lifestyle. Bolivar removes his wig and says he only does it for the women. Seconds later, Jim tells F he needs to see something in the cargo area. In the cargo area, F sees an intricately carved 9-foot-tall coffin-like cabinet that wasn't in the manifest. When they open it, it contains nothing but soil. He tells Jim to take samples of the earth and plastic seal the cabinet afterward. Nora sees a latch inside the cabinet door and wonders why anyone would place it there. F asks Bishop to contact Berlin to find out who put the cabinet on the plane. Afterward, Bishop speaks to someone from Berlin, but the call gets cut when his ears start to ring and he hears whispering around him. He follows the sound to the back of the cargo area where he finds a moving pile of cloth on the floor. Suddenly, a tall, hooded creature rises, shooting a thick mouth-like appendage onto Bishop's neck. A proboscis from the appendage inserts into the man's neck, reaching his artery and draining his blood. After feeding, the creature snaps Bishop's neck, drops him to the floor, and smashes his head with its massive hand before fleeing. At 11.15pm in Harlem, Icorse finds Gus Elizalde, Crispin's brother, and hands him money and instructs him to drive a van from the airport to a specific destination. At first, Gus declines the offer because he wishes to leave a life of crime just as he promised his mother. Then, Icorse shows him a copy of Crispin's criminal record and his mother's immigration status. Gus thinks it's a threat, but the man assures him that once he finishes the task, they'll erase his brother's record and his mother's status will be fixed. Gus agrees to do one last job for the man, so Icarus tells him the rest of the money is in the glove box, and the pre-programmed destination is in the van's GPS. He gives Gus three rules to follow. He shouldn't examine the cargo, not make any stops, and must cross the bridge back to Manhattan before sunrise. At 11.30pm in the JFK airport terminal, Cetrakian sees the passengers' families and Bolivar's fans being held back by police. One cop asks him to stay behind the perimeter. He sees Jim and figures he must be in charge, so he takes a medicine canister from his coat and pretends to feel ill. Then, Jim approaches the older man to see if he needs help. Cetrakian says he needs to speak to the person in charge about the plane. Later, F speaks to the passengers' families and Nora is disappointed at Everett to find the press already there. F tells the crowd that 206 passengers perished, but they did so peacefully, while only 4 survived. Frustrated with the doctor's vague answers, Gary, Emma's father, slaps F and demands to see his daughter, dead or alive. The doctor tells the crowd he'll have more answers for them after 48 hours and leaves. At 11.40 in the chief medical examiner's office, Dr. Bennett is on a video call with F and tells his colleagues that all the bodies have the same incision on their necks that reach their carotid arteries. He then slices one of the passenger's arms, showing F and Nora a white opalescent liquid leaking from the cut. The blood has seemingly lost all of its red blood cells. Minutes later, Jim introduces Cetrakian to F, who feels more important matters are at hand. 
When he and Nora are about to leave for the cargo hold, Satrakian says he knows the bodies aren't decomposing normally. He says the heads of all the passengers, dead or alive, must be severed and their bodies burned. F tells the police to arrest Satrakian for causing a panic, but as they take the older man away, he asks F if they found the coffin because that means they still have him. Shocked, Nora wonders how Satrakian knew about the coffin. Satrakian tells them to destroy the coffin and not allow it to cross the river. At Dr. Bennett's office, he examines one body in a UV light chamber and is perplexed at the thin white lines under the skin. Meanwhile, F finds a worm in the cargo hold and picks it up. As Nora is about to touch it, the worm moves toward her hand desperately. F thinks it's looking for a host and believes the worm might be the carrier of the mysterious disease. He places it inside a transparent box for testing. Seconds later, Nora scoops soil from a crevice in the floor, and on it are even more worms. Moments later, F and Nora rush back to the cargo area, but the coffin is gone. They check the security cam feed and a distortion in the footage shows them a figure seemingly lifting the box away in a split second. Because the footage is 7 minutes old, F thinks the coffin might still be in the airport. At 4.40am, Gus finds the van in the airport utility garage and gets inside. He finds the money in the glove box and sees the massive coffin behind him. He then starts the vehicle and drives out of the garage. Meanwhile, F calls Jim and tells him to secure the perimeter and to stop any vehicles that might be big enough to contain the coffin. As Gus exits the garage, a cop tells him to pull up by the side of the road and asks for his ID and permit. Gus hands the cop the black card i gave him, but the cop doesn't know what it's for. Suddenly, the police dog barks while it's inspecting the van, and the cop asks Gus to step out and open the van. Panicked, Gus becomes defensive about the cop's orders until Jim arrives and sees the card. After checking the card, he tells the cop to let Gus through. When the cop leaves, Jim tells Gus to tell Eichhorst he's done working for them. Meanwhile, Dr. Bennett notes abnormal growth in the body's organs and places a heart on the weighing scale. He steps away for a moment when he hears a noise from the other end of the room. When he returns to the scale, he sees the heart moving and picks it up. Worms fall off the heart and the doctor drops it, but one worm burrows into his flesh. He fearfully pulls the worm out with tweezers but doesn't notice the reanimated corpses behind him. With nowhere to run, the passengers attack the doctor with the long appendages from their mouths. At the airport, Jim apologizes to F for coming up empty-handed. F shows Jim the box with the soil and worms slithering inside it. In jail, Satrakian sits in a cell and the man notices the numbers tattooed on his arm. At the penthouse, Icor tells Palmer everything went as planned and that love will soon guide the passengers home. Palmer says a man with a sword was arrested at the airport and Icor says he'll take care of Satrakian. At 4.55am, as Gus drives across the bridge, he calls his mother and tells her he'll be home in an hour. At 5.29, in Gary's home, he places Emma's framed picture back on the table. He walks to the living room and cries for his daughter when he hears a noise from the glass door and sees Emma entering. The young girl holds out her arms and tells her father she feels cold. Gary hugs his daughter but doesn't see the girl blink her vertical eyelids. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.